and tabernacled among us. He lived, it's, the, it's the word for a tabernacle, that thing in the desert, in that incredible temple that never saw the glory of God. Ooh, how did he deal with that? Didn't God say the glory of this house, of the latter house, would be greater than the glory of the former house? And yet there was never any glory in that house. The glory of God never fell there. The fire of God never showed up. It was, you know, built, it was rebuilt, it was eventually destroyed. How do you deal with that verse? Just, yeah. The last verse of chapter 3, uh, the, the last sentence of uh, that verse in chapter 3, it says, No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. I think that uh, relates to what they were saying as far as uh, God's son had not taken on the When this was written, they didn't have that uh, concept. Mm. What was the question I just asked? Before I was so rudely interrupted by the man in the blue shirt. <laughs> oh, I see you all were paying attention. Uh, <laughs> the word became flesh. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I actually had a question. Go ahead. Um, you said the glory of the latter house would be greater than the glory of the latter house. Oh, yes. And your answer? He wasn't talking about it. No, that would not at all fit the context of, of Habakkuk, you know, which is where that was said. The people wouldn't have thought of it that way. The writer wouldn't have thought of it that way. But it's a good thought. But one day, one day, this little baby was carried into the temple. And there was this old man there who had had a promise spoken to him by God. And he said, Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for I have seen that was the day, I believe. Way greater glory in the scope of history, not necessarily in some physical manifestation, Okay, how did I get off of that <laughs> stuff? All right. Uh, reflection. It's getting too late. Uh, the teachers. Yes. Okay, yes. So I think all these technology stuff is really a form, not the real meaning, the real sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another potential thing to put into your under the sun category of nothing new. Okay, so the teacher's pursuit of pleasure. I didn't write this up there because there's way too much, but he said, I pursued pleasure and happiness and all these things in work. I have all the verses written out, but I can email you a copy of this if you desperately want it. It's pretty dull and boring. Uh, DNB, not DND. Uh, wisdom, madness, pleasure, laughter, wine, uh, fame, possessions and wealth, uh, seeking justice, seeking uh, to be solitary, get away by yourself, seeking to help others, to have power, to be involved in injustice, to have money. Oh, that's kind of a repeat. Uh, enjoyment, honor, children, long life, food, a good name. That kind of gives you a clue that Solomon was involved in writing this. Maybe we'll get there, I don't know. Uh, women, 
uh, obedience to a higher power, religion, having a legacy, having adventure, having might, and being lazy. Those are all ways that in this book that the writer says he tried to find happiness and never found it. Oh, so, yeah, if you want this. Here, somebody can have this copy right here. <laughs> all right, so here's some more of this stuff. Excitement, fun, fun. This has the verses, though. Um... Uh, What's Solomon's view of the afterlife? You see that in chapter 2? You're dead, you're dead. It's done, it's too late, it's over, you're gone, you're dead like a dog. We gotta get moving here. Everything you ever do or everything you ever accomplish in your life is all meaningless because you're gonna die and you're not gonna get to benefit of the benefits of it for very long and you'll give it to somebody and who knows whether that person will be a creep or not that's basically what he says so it's all meaningless hello uh, let's just look at this in chapter 2 here uh, 24 through 26 My glasses are not meaningless at this point. <laughs> A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and si find satisfaction in work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. But this too is meaningless and a chasing after the wind. Does that really sound like sound theology? That God only blesses those who believe in him and uh, poor sinners, everything they get is going to go to those who are better than them? I think Jesus said the opposite, actually. What did he say? That's right. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Oh. I really have to work on my aim, you know. <laughs> All right. So, when you become backslidden, you get confused. Right seems wrong, wrong seems right. Life is a mess and the sad thing is you don't even know it. You never know how far you've fallen. You know, I, I think of that lament over King Saul when he was killed on Mount Gilboa. And the lament is how the mighty have fallen how the glory of Israel lies slain on the heights. You just don't know how far you're going to go when you start walking the other direction. Like that poem, sin will take you further than you ever wanted to stray. All right, where are we? Ah, we are at break time. So let's get break time. We'll try to fly through the rest of this and get on to Song of Solomon. So, if, yeah.
fine. He doesn't. I just thought it'd be fine. And uh, just a reminder that all of those items that he had put on the board and, and on the Awaken uh, Facebook page, um, those are very important, but also what it, it, it means to you after you go through each one of those questions. So please put uh, your reflective uh, application in there, what, what God may be saying through what you learned in the character study of David uh, to you now in the season and, and what that means uh, and what it looks like you walking that out. So those are uh, the, the takeaways that, that are important that we'll be looking for. Okay. Um, all right. Randall. 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 When, when I'm in the British Empire, I always go by Randall. Uh, so, some of you will know why. If you want to ask me afterwards. Uh, uh. All right. So we've really. It, am I on? Am I? Yeah, it's on. Does it need to be higher? Hello. All right. You know the dirty little secret is. If they weren't recording, I don't even need the stinking microphone. <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's see. In an hour and a half, we've got all the way through an introduction and two chapters. Uh, how are we going to get through the next ten chapters plus another whole book? Um, we will be having lecture tonight at nine o'clock. <laughs> you all are required to be there. <laughs> we'll, we'll pull an all-nighter. All right, so, or we'll end up like the last school and have almost no time for the Song of Solomon. So, you know, I'm going to pick up the pace. Giddy up. Chapter 3, uh, there's the great song to Chapter 3. Oh, that's Chapter 4 already. See how quick it's going to go? Uh, there's a great song. Who wrote that song back in the 60s? I said it the other day. The birds! Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh. No, it wasn't Andy Bird, and it wasn't his dad. <laughs> but not a bad thought. Uh, I, I may have to remember that one for later. Uh, yeah, to everything there's a season, and that's where this whole chapter goes. Oh, let's see. I'll, I'd sing it for you, but the class would end really quickly. Um, and, and for those who haven't heard me sing yet, you can just ask my wife. She'll be glad to. She, she snuck in the back door, and uh, she is witness. Uh, all right, so there's nothing great or profound other than the song in Chapter 3, so let's just move right along. Chapter 4, the importance of community and friendships, and it's all meaningless. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't write it. I only work here. Um, we, we already looked at this verse about Jeroboam, or possibly about Jeroboam. Chapter 5, either do what you said you're going to do or keep your mouth shut. You know, it's better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. Not a bad piece of advice. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. That's like the best thing he says in the entire book. Um, I would love to just take half an hour to talk about standing in awe of God and the awe of God in general, but then we wouldn't get anything out of the Song of Solomon. So you just have to look it up yourself and study it and meditate on it and because I hate to break it to Solomon here but standing in awe of God is not meaningless whoever loves money never has enough 
Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. And you can ask my wife this next one. Whoever loves photography can never push the shutter button enough times. <laughs> <laughs> So whoever loves money never has enough. I have this, this long, long time friend uh, on the mainland by the name of Wayne Mayo. Uh, for, for 10 years he was also my pastor, but we were friends before he started this little church and I went out and worked with him. But he had a friend who was a multimillionaire, wasn't a believer, and he and Wayne could get away with saying anything to each other at any point. Wayne could preach the gospel to him. He could tell Wayne he was crazy. You know, they were friends. They could do stuff like that. And it didn't affect their friendship at all. But one day, Wayne looked at him and he goes, um, how much money is enough? And the guy looked back at him and he said, just a little bit more. He's already a multimillionaire. Just a little bit more. You, you look at, oh, probably most of you don't even know the name, Ricky Henderson. He was a famous baseball player back somewhere, maybe the 80s or 90s. And he was, he was the best baseball player of his day at the time. And um, a couple years later, he was given a nice fat, the biggest contract for the best player. And a couple years later, because prices kept going ridiculous, some other guy was given more money than he was, who wasn't as good as he is. And so literally on, on national TV, I was at my brother's spending a weekend with him. And his house had cable, which I didn't even have a TV, much less cable. Um, but his house had cable. And so we, we saw Ricky Henderson on ESPN. It was just so unfair and so horrible and so un and it's literally teams terrors are streaming down his face complaining that this player who's not as good as he is is making more money and it was just and he said he can quit and so the owner gave him more money and that's where the whole crazy salary escalation and you know now you got people making 20 million dollars a year to play a game and let's see this big fight last weekend uh, even the guy who won, even if he lost, was going to make 180 million bucks. And the loser made 120 million. Insane, but it's never enough. They've already talked about doing a rematch where they'll each make a whole lot more money. I mean, it's never enough. There's always some consuming inside you for stuff. And in a sense, Solomon was right about this bit. It is rather meaningless. You can't take it when you go. You know, God has plenty of gold in heaven. Uh, the streets are made out of it. So don't bring your own. Uh, <laughs> yours wouldn't be as good as his anyway. And who, who needs more sidewalks in heaven, you know? Um, but just total, if you go down that path, you're going to go far and not for the good. If money consumes you, if the desire for money and more money consumes you, dare I say you're not a believer? Ooh. Ouch. God alone knows the hearts of all men, but if you're consumed with the temporary things of this world, temporary vanities rather than eternal verities, somebody once said to me, if you're consumed with those things, then, and like Solomon had become, did he not? Was he not the richest man of his day? Did he not have it all? And yet, it wasn't enough. He had to get the mark of the beast amount of gold every year because it just wasn't enough no matter how much okay so here chapter six you're gonna lose it all anyway so it's all meaningless and vain uh, losing let's see I have seen another evil under the sun well I don't think he gets the definition of the word evil to start with but I've seen this other evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on man. 
God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing that his heart desires, but God does not enable him to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless and a grievous evil. Well, that statement is not true at all. This is another one of those crazy... Un do rich people get to enjoy their money? Uh, all you have to do is go down to the bay and you can see Bill Gates's or Paul Allen's uh, little mansion on the waterfront there. And sometimes he comes in with his boat, the Octopus, which has two submarines, two helicopters, a speedboat. Oh, and he has another one too. I don't know much about that one though. And you know, these guys aren't like miserable sitting there. Oh. <laughs> That was Solomon. That was not these guys. Sol Again, not everything in here is true. Ooh. We don't like to think of the Bible that way, but again, not everything in here was said, spoken by God or under the inspiration of God. So, what else do we have here for this? Oh, enjoy what you have. Um, how do you enjoy life if you don't know what comes after it. I mean, I have been way, you know, man, before I was saved, I grew up in a, in a, not really a Christian home, but with a, I, I grew up in a religious Christian home, kinda. And I always knew as a boy, I was always fairly certain that I was going to hell. How'd you like to live like that? Over and over you're thinking, like I told you about the lightning the other day, and God just missed, but next time he's going to get me. Um, and that's how I lived. Man, I didn't want to live and I didn't want to die. It was all meaningless. It became meaningless, fortunately, because I got saved, and now I have the, the confidence and assurance of eternal life and seeing him face to face. But if you don't know what comes next, life is pretty miserable. When I was a kid, we, I went to this Bible study my mom took me and dropped me off at, and they were, when I got there, they were studying the book of Revelation. And I don't think I was ever so scared in my whole life. I don't think there was a horror movie that I ever saw as a kid. And, you know, I saw some great ones, like, I saw what you did and I know who you were. Uh, and, you know... Yeah, it was... <laughs> a documentary. <laughs> anyway... I just had no confidence of what was going to happen to me after I died and usually I was scared. I would literally at times lay awake at be in my bed at night crying because I was sure I was going to hell. Youch. But for the grace of God. <laughs> oh, so hey, enjoy your life because you don't know. I couldn't enjoy my life. I was a pretty unhappy boy. Um, oh, we just don't have time for all of this fun stuff. God has made both joy and sorrow. Let, I, I, I put a question mark on that, so let's see what this one says. This translation says, When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider... God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. I don't know how it reads in this one, but let's find out. Where was I? Uh oh. 714. Am I even in the right chapter? I hate it when this happens. Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Can somebody name another verse that says something similar to this? This is one of those great justice controversies. God gives and takes away. What else? 
in, in Isaiah, uh, it says, I am the Lord and I create light and I create darkness. I do evil and I do good. Ooh. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. <laughs> okay, no, you can't smoke it on campus though, okay? You, you gotta go off campus if you're gonna put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. <laughs> okay, so why be so righteous? Hey, it doesn't matter. God made good. God made mad. Gladness. He made sorrow. There's no difference in any of it. Ah, whatever. <laughs> and then <laughs> that was kind of Solomon. Solomon esque. Um, so then this this outrageously hilarious little section here. And um, look, says the teacher. This is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was searching, but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand. But not one upright woman! And how, how many wives did he have? One thousand. Ooh. That's why he kept getting more and more. He just couldn't find a good woman. <laughs> I, where? <laughs> I had nothing to do with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, how does he come up with this stuff? Well, you know, when you take a bunch of idolaters for your wives, then you're probably not going to find a good one. All right, chapter 8. Oh, this is a great verse. Uh, just on our whirlwind tour now. Then, too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city limits where they did this. But this, too, is meaningless. That doesn't even sound right. Oh, 8, 10. Am I even in the right place? Yeah. Oh, it's verse 11. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. In other words, if you let justice go and go and go and don't punish the wrongdoer, it's going to encourage all sorts of other people to do all sorts of wrong and wicked and evil stuff. Ding! Solomon got one thing right anyway in all of his crazy observations. Um, Oh, you're here at a good time, hon. This was Chris and I 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> all, all our 20 years ago, there wasn't digital, and we haven't had our wedding pictures digitalized. Uh, but we look just like that, only different. Uh, the, the funny thing is, when we uh, went from the church to where we were having our reception, uh, you know, people say, uh, you know, I'll make some comment about Greek, and people will say, do you know Greek? And I'll say, yeah, I know this little Greek guy, Jimmy Apostolos. He's about this tall, and on our wedding day, he lent us his T-top car as our getaway car. And so we jump into this little Firebird with almost no room to sit in, and then Chris's wedding dress is like billowing out of the car. <laughs> We, we, we'd like needing to strap it in place. Um, everything is chance. It all just happens. God's not really involved. And it's all meaningless. Oh, bummer. You mean? Oh, never mind. This is an interesting little story. It doesn't have great meaning to it, but there's this city that gets attacked. And it's way outnumbered, and they want to make peace with those who are attacking, and nobody can come up with anything good to say. And so this poor old man goes out and he makes peace. And then with their immense gratitude, they say, get lost. Thanks, we'll never think of you again. 
and this too is meaningless. Poor guy. We all like to receive a little acclaim for what we do. Um, it's one of our downfalls. <laughs> Seeking acclaim for what we do. But that's another preach for another day. Um, so then you get this whole section of Proverbs, and some of them sound amazingly similar to some of Solomon's other problems. Um, there's one, a couple chapters back, where was it? Oh, in chapter 7 he says, A good name is better than fine perfume. What proverb does that sound like? For two peppermint patties. Does anyone know what proverb that sounds like? 29.6. No. <laughs> Twenty-two. Twenty-two verse one. A good name is to be desired more than two peppermint patties. <laughs> more than great riches. You're way better off with a good name. And so that's kind of another one of those clues that Solomon wrote this book. Because you, you find all these similarities between his former writings and this. Uh, and then... Remember your maker. Don't forget. It's so easy when you're young to just run and jump and have fun. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. In the, before the days of trouble come and the years approached when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. A friend of mine, actually, um, somebody I knew many, I went, the gal who became his wife was part of my first missions trip overseas back in the late 70s. And he was part of a group called the Beulah Band, and they did a song about remember your maker in the days of your youth. Uh, it was a great song. If you ever get to find a Beulah Band album, uh, it's great Irish music. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of... Uh, foot stomping and whatever, but I don't have it anymore, I'm sorry to say. And If you find it, let me know. I'll buy it from you. <laughs> so, it's easy for you to forget, in particular if they don't have godly parents who are reminding them. You know, I hate to say it, but my niece, who's, you know, now taller than me, she's never heard about God. Other than from me and my wife, she has never once been instructed about God. And so, hence, she just had a baby unmarried. She's, you know, she is totally, and this is, you know, this isn't true in all cases, but she is just so totally clueless about God. It's heartbreaking that somebody could be that secularized, that she doesn't have the slightest idea. I mean, her mom kind of believes in God, but kind of, but never said anything to her. But remember your creator. The teacher wrote many proverbs in, let's see, 9 and 10 down here. Well, verse 8, back to the theme. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, we read this but he also imparted knowledge. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. Except in this book. <laughs> um, the words of the wise are like goads. You know, they kind of poke you and get you thinking in the right direction. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of, any, of anything in addition to them. So here's the son theme once again that we talked about yesterday in Proverbs. Of making many books, there is no end. And all the DBSers say amen to this next line. <laughs> and many and much study wearies the body. Hey, staff say the same thing. 
Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's as far as he could go. You know, it was a good conclusion for him to come to. And some people say this proves Solomon wasn't backslid at the end of his life. I don't know that this really proves that. Uh, maybe this was actually somebody putting this at the end. Whoever compiled this stuff. But fear God. We won't go through it all again. And we hardly touched on it yesterday. But fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of men. That kind of, to me, says they still haven't got it. Because love is not duty. No. Nope. Love is not duty. We fear God because we love him. We fear God because we respect him. We fear God because he reveals himself to us. It's not our duty to fear God. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or bad. Uh, all right. What's... I don't know. It's hard to say what the true meaning of life is. But here's a potential. Life plus God equals meaning. That does not mean A plus B equals C and C is greater than B. That's, that's not a mathematical formula. Oh, fair or the Lord, we won't go there. I think that the author made some great observations. If you look at the things he just... He, Solomon was great at observing stuff. You know, it says that he classified all sorts of plants and animals and he described all... He was really good at looking at stuff. But because of his refusal to obey the commands of God, he came to a lot of wrong conclusions. And I think this book is, even though there is some things that I would say, yes, this is real, this is great, this is inspirational, a lot of it is just bad conclusions that Solomon came to from his great observational skills that God gave him. So, you know, don't take this book and make it a hard nose. This is my theology of life. Because you'll probably not be a very happy person. So, I just have a couple more things I wanted to say or show you about meaninglessness. And this one won't be another black screen. We are about... <laughs> we're about to embark upon the great crusades for which we have striven these many months the eyes of the world are upon you but have full but I have full confidence in your courage devotion to duty and your skill in the battle Eisenhower said that to his troops before they got on those ships and invaded France is that worthless was that meaningless I don't think so. Man, I, when we went to D.C., I was, you know, like a little puddle. This is all by a giant fountain, and it's like, I wonder if the fountain has been filled with tears of people going to those monuments. They fought together as brothers in arms. They died together, and now they sleep by, side by side. To them, we have a solemn obligation. As Americans, as the world, a free world, not controlled any longer by fascism and Nazism, those people who laid down their lives. Admiral Nimitz says we have a solemn obligation. Unfortunately, we tend to forget this stuff. That's why they make memorials. This is about the Battle of Midway. They had, no, they had no right to win, yet they did. 
And in doing so, they changed the course of the war. Even against the greatest of odds, there is something in the human spirit, a magic blend of skill, faith, and valor that can lift men from certain defeat to incredible victory. There's something inside of you that is not meaningless. God has created this spirit inside of you that is able to commune with him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to rise up and do the impossible. Sometimes physically. I don't know if you've ever studied the Battle of Midway. The Americans didn't stand a chance and they won. They were vastly outnumbered and overwhelmed by the Japanese. And yet they won. I even think of my own dad who never once talked about his time in the Philippines in the war at the Battle of Leyte. Even though he wasn't involved in shooting and whatever, he was a radio guy. But he never once could talk about it. I don't think it's meaningless that God has put into the hearts of men what is right and what is wrong and to stand up for that right. I think it's meaningless if you refuse to take a stand like that speech I gave you yesterday. That is meaningless. That is actually evil. Would Solomon think the cross is meaningless? You know, when you get backslidden enough, yes, people do. People who have walked with Christ walk away. And what does Paul say? That they re-crucify the Son of God. Or not Paul, the writer of Hebrews. Some people say it's Paul. Andrew Greenplate. <laughs> um, is the cross meaningless? I don't think so. I'm sure none of you think so. I'm going to read you something I wrote. If I can. <laughs> I don't know if I can read this. I wish I had actually put the picture that I have of this um, in here, but I, it didn't even cross my mind. But this, I wrote December 18th, 1998. I had, for seven years, I had my best job ever at, in my 32 at UPS. And I drove from the airport to the Dalles, 85 miles away and back. And then I did it a second time and I'd make a few deliveries here and there. And be phenomenally beautiful. But I was not interested in beauty this morning. As I drove out of Portland this morning towards the Dalles in my UPS truck, I was quiet and somewhat depressed. It was dark and a light mist was falling as I proceeded east on Interstate 84, but my thoughts and my heart were not on the drive or the weather. My nation was in the process of bombing another nation. My president was about to face impeachment, and the soon-to-be Speaker of the House had just admitted to having several extramarital affairs. My heart was heavy with sorrow for both my own nation and the people of Iraq. How could we have fallen so low? How much lower would we sink? Would we ever regain any of our lost authority in the world? As I continued down the highway, I was almost in tears. As I prayed for the safety of the people of Iraq and for the mess in our own land, I was feeling hopeless and depressed. As I approached exit 35 on the interstate, I saw a light in the distance. As I got closer, I realized that I was looking at a cross that was about 20 feet tall and had been outlined by Christmas lights. I instantly recalled the verse of an old hymn. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. The hymn was written by Sir Robert Browning, then governor of Hong Kong. He had gone to visit the island of Macao, or Macau, I think it's Macau, and saw a huge bronze cross that had been built as part of a church about a hundred years before his visit. The building itself had been destroyed by a typhoon, but the cross still stood, unmoved by the fierce elements. 
The cross I saw is erected on the property of two homes, the larger of which was destroyed in a landslide almost three years ago. The house is now a pile of rubble in the midst of a field of boulders, but the cross still stands, sending its light and message of hope to all who drive up the interstate. The sorrow and depression did not instantly leave me as I gazed at that cross on the side of the highway, but a deep sense that God was still on the throne and that he ultimately rules in the affairs of man overshadowed my depression and sorrow. Soon I recalled the words of the psalmist who, write, who wrote, Why so downcast, O my soul? And why so disquieted within me? Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, my Savior and my God. As we continue on this holiday season, as the world, and perhaps our very government, continues to fall apart around us, remember the victory of Christ on the cross. Set your mind, heart, thoughts, and hope fully on this amazing act of love that has survived and thrived the past 2,000 years in the face of much opposition. Most of these wrecks of time are now gone. But the message of the cross still shines as brightly as the lighted cross I saw in the darkness of the early hours of 